Amen. Amen. Whew, good singing today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As Minister Chris mentioned, we've been talking about um, how to live this life. And we've discovered that there's certain things we need to do in order to live life and live it to the fullest or to have life and have it more abundantly. And last week we kind of talked about uh, some things that we need to do in our lives and simply we need to come to a point where we are apprehending certain areas of our lives, apprehending certain areas of our lives. And we were looking specifically at um, James chapter 1 and verse 18. And just that one verse, we, we didn't finish it, uh, but it, it reads simply in the uh, New King James of his own will. He brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruit of his creatures. Keep standing. Of his own will. One of the things we talked about is that we need to apprehend and we, we did a quick little English lesson about apprehending and, and, and maybe the word is comprehend, meaning to understand, but apprehend means to, to grasp, arrest, to take hold of. And one of the things that you and I need to do more often and, and, and practice is really understanding and arresting and grabbing and taking hold of our salvation, especially in the way that God meant it. It's not something that we just do and then go about our business, but God had some intent behind salvation. And so we learned about his will when it comes to salvation. And of his will, we found out that he brought us. He brought us. He, he secured us. He made the way for you and I to get saved. Um, and so New Living Translation, that's why I want you to keep standing. New Living Translation says, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, have become his prized possession. Now you may see, be seated. God, God chose to save us, watch this, so he could show us off. So he could show us off. So he could show the world what he can do when he gets a hold of a life. And so apprehension is something that uh, we need to come to grips with. So last week, we just looked at one of the areas, and that was apprehending the, the will of salvation, understanding that God's will was designed to choose us, to want us, so that he could show us off. Now, I've come to understand that people have maybe different interpretations of apprehension, um, and, and I understand that only because I see certain Christians who live differently. I, I wish I would say we should all live the same way, but most of us as Christians live differently. We, we, we all have our, our way of living, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, and so I've come to the conclusion that people have different uh, definitions, mindsets, or, or uh, understanding of what apprehension means. I, I came across this, uh, this, this, this thing I found, and um, it talked about uh, the differences when it comes to apprehension, or, or uh, apprehending, I should say. And um, sitting around the, the office table, an argument broke out in the government. And they began to argue about who had the best agency. Was it the CIA, the NSA, was it uh, uh, the FBI, or, or was it just the local police department? They began to argue about who had the best. So they decided to test them. And the way they tested them was they let a rabbit loose in the forest. And they said, now, we're going to see who's the best agency. Go find the rabbit. And so what we find is, is that the CIA and the NSA went in and they did all their forensics. They uh, placed animal informants in the forest. They did DNA tests on the leaves and the trees. And after three months of investigative, uh, uh, in investigative extensive investigating, 
the NSA CIA came out and concluded that rabbits don't exist. That was their idea of apprehending the rabbit. Then they sent the FBI in. And the FBI goes in and after two weeks of interviewing people, uh, they decided to burn the whole forest. <laughs> Killed everything in it, including the rabbit. Made no apologies and decided that the rabbit had it coming. Then they sent the police in. Two hours later, they came out with a badly beaten bear. And as they're dragging the bear out the forest, they hear the bear yelling, okay, I'm a rabbit, I'm a rabbit. <laughs> Everybody has their idea or opinion about apprehending. Just like there's different opinions, the truth of the matter is that while we should all be on the same page in the church, we're not. There are a couple of thoughts, theological thoughts regarding this thing called salvation and, and how it pertains to how we call folks from sin to salvation. Um, I, I guess if I opened up testimony, many of you would give different viewpoints or testimonies about how you came to know the Lord. We all came from different areas and different situations and different experiences. And, and so this theological debate is about the call of the sinner unto salvation. Um, we don't do it much in our church. Um, uh, you'll, you'll understand what I'm getting ready to say. We don't do it much in our church, but I belong um, to the, we're, we're Southern Baptists for those who didn't know. And um, I'm in meetings with some of my um, Anglo brothers. And uh, some of the issues that bother us don't bother them. And some of the issues that bother them don't bother us. And one of the issues is something called Calvinism. Now, some of you theologians may know what Calvinism is. For the rest of you, like, what's that? Because truthfully, it don't bother us. But they are sticklers regarding something called Calvinism. And just for your FYI, Calvinism is a doctrine that states that those who are called to God, the sinner that's called to God, has no choice in the matter. That he's called to God because God called him before the foundation of the world. That's what the scripture says. We, we are called before the foundation of the world. While we were yet in our parents' wombs, that's what Jeremiah said, God called me. And so when you think of that thought that God knew who was going to be saved and called us before the foundation of the world, the Calvinist says, you don't have a choice about it. God already saved you. Now, that's a problem for others. Because when you talk about you didn't have a choice in the matter and that God saved you from the beginning, from the foundation of the world, he knew in his mind that you were going to be saved, then that says something to the doctrine of whosoever will -ism. Because the other side of the scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. So how do you, how, how do you navigate between God choosing, but also saying whoever wants to? There's a, there's a conundrum. There's a problem there because if you say that I don't have no choice, that whatever I do in life, I can raise all kinds of hell, at some point I'm going to get saved because God chose me. That, that's, and, and oh, by the way, the, the other part of that Calvinistic doctrine says this, that if God does the choosing and he's the one that chooses who will be saved, then there's no need for us to witness. That's the other side of that Calvinistic thinking. 
But then again, there's that whosoever will doctrine, which states that a sinner can come to salvation at any time in any manner, just by simply giving the gospel and accepting the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so when you think about this, this whole concept uh, of, of apprehending um, the second one, apprehending the word of salvation, most of us have to reconcile and understand what God's word says about our salvation. Not only do we know he wanted us saved, but we also need to know how he had us saved. And the word of God brings that to us. And so from a Calvinistic view and a whosoever will view, there's a line in the middle. Because the Bible is the Bible. It does not contradict itself. And so what we do is we draw basically from both thinkings that, yes, the, the Lord that we know, the God that we serve, did choose us, according to the scriptures, before the foundation of the world. He did do that. And on the other side, whosoever will, Lottie, Dottie, and everybody, whoever accepts Jesus will be saved. That also applies. But how does that apply that I can interject myself and say I want to be saved when God has already saved me. Boy, y'all ask great questions. So here it is. Simply this, that even though God has chosen us before the foundation of the world, none of us knows that you've been chosen. In other words, while he chooses us before the foundation of the world, he doesn't publicize that. He doesn't advertise that. He doesn't tell you, listen, you can go out and smoke as much henny, uh, smoke as much weed and drink as much henny as you want because at one day, probably June 2nd at 2 o'clock, I'm going to save you. No, he don't do that. He don't give us forewarning. He doesn't tell us that we're on the salvation list. He knows who he saved. What he says to us is, because you don't know, you need to get saved. Whosoever will... Let them come. Matter of fact, I heard a great theologian one time kind of put it this way, and I've taught it here at Sharon, but for those of you who weren't here, think of a doorpost. Look at this doorpost that says exit. Y'all see that there? Well, let's change the, let's change the sign to, from exit to say whosoever will, let them come. Meaning that door is open for everybody. Anybody that wants to walk through it, whosoever will. Let them come, walk through the door. Now, here's the key. While it's an invitation to everybody, everybody won't go through it. Unfortunately, I'm telling you, everybody who ever wants to walk through, whosoever will, let them come, walk through that door. Everybody's not coming through that door. But you have a right to go through that door. So now a few of you say, you know what, that's a whosoever will sign. I think I'm going to take advantage of that. I'm going to walk through that door. The moment you walk through that door, and look back on the inside of the door, it says chosen before the foundation of the world. In other words, you don't know if you've been chosen until you walk through the door. Are y'all with me here? And so it takes a little bit from both to understand this word of truth. Notice he, he says, uh, uh, if you will, in the text, he says, he, um, of his own will, he brought us forth, how? By the word of truth. And so it's important to understand that God's word explains and gives clarity to our salvation. And, and the reason we need to apprehend this is because if you don't understand your salvation, then you treat it like you don't understand. Something that's valuable to you, you treat like it's valuable. Something that's casual or something that really doesn't mean much, you treat it that way. And so he gives us this powerful word that calls sinners. That's the word of God. It calls sinners. It, 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 it just, uh, 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 in other words, it's, a, it's not only a, a powerful word, but it's a persuasive word. That, that not only calls sinners, but convicts sinners. See, one of the things I love about God's word is not only does it call you, it convicts you. Can I tell you a sign of knowing that you, are, you know God, that you're saved? 
Before I met God, I used to do some stuff and ain't feel bad about it. Matter of fact, I lined up the next one. Wish I had help. But then when I met him and I did some stuff, I felt kind of rough about it. I felt bad about it. I felt troubled about it. I'm sorry. I felt convicted about it. Why? Because, see, when you get saved, when the Lord comes into your life, now there's the Holy Spirit for my Pentecostal friends, the Holy Ghost, who now is in you, convicting you, pulling you, tugging you, letting you know that what you did is not what God is pleased with. And that's where the guilt is conviction and the embarrassment and all of that stuff comes upon you to now you're like, wow, why did I do that? But you don't feel that if you don't know Jesus. Why? Because you're doing what comes naturally. Sinners sin, birds fly, fish swim. We do what comes naturally. But when you become a child of God, sinning is now not natural. Why? Because God took it away from you. So here's what he says. He says, so it's this word of truth. Are y'all with me here? That is persuasive to the point where it convicts the sinner. The word of God alone remains the only instrument to new birth. What do you mean the only instrument? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You can't come to faith unless you read the word of God. What do you mean by that? I just walked the aisle, I got saved. But you just walked the aisle and got saved, but your faith cannot increase until you get more word in you. I learn, I, I, I eat, I digest the word of God, and I begin to understand more about God. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God. It's the deutimus, the dynamite of God. And and he helps us to understand our salvation. Why do I need the word? Dynamite blows stuff up. And so as I get more word in me, it starts to blow up stuff in my life. My anger issues, boom. My cussing tongue, boom. My drinking habit, boom. My weed smoking, boom. But I need more word to blow that stuff up. See, the word of God is powerful, sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It is a weapon that the Holy Spirit uses to bring sinners to their knees. Amen. Here's the conundrum. Sin will keep you from the word. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. But the word will keep you from sin. Are y'all with me here? Y- y'all, y'all don't understand. The word convicts. The word will stop you in your tracks woman came home from church. She had gone to Sunday school. She had had church. She came home, and when she walked in, there was this dude in her house robbing her. Thank God, in church, she had just uh, learned about Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where it says, he calls sinners to repent. And so when she saw the guy robbing her, she shouted, Acts 2, 38, and he froze. Didn't move. She went and called the cops. Cops showed up. He's still standing there. They handcuffed him. They moving him out. They asked the lady, what, what happened? She said, I walked in. He was robbing me, and all I could think was to quote the scripture, so I quoted the scripture. And so they said to the man, they said, man, you stopped in your tracks. You ain't moved just because he quoted scripture. He said, scriptures? I thought she said she had an ax in 238s. The word of God. (laughs) Will stop you in your tracks. The Bible, the Bible is self-contained. No, when I say self-contained, the word has no outside source. No outside power. It it, it conducts and concludes its mission. And everybody that is saved will come by hearing the word of God. Amen? 
So that's the message. The message, it convicts. But here's the method of how. Because in the church today, preachers have abandoned the message. Too many preachers are preaching a prosperity gospel, a make you feel good gospel, a, 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 a make you shout gospel. See, the word will make you shout, but it also will make you stop in your tracks and it'll make you understand the, the errors of your way. See, just like a water pipe is a channel through uh, which the water flows, uh, the pipe itself has no power. And so when it comes to preachers, preachers can never rise to anything greater than what they preach. Why do I say that? Stop hero worshiping preachers. As a preacher, I'm telling you, when we stand in this pulpit, God does something. It ain't us. And outside of this pulpit, I heard somebody say, we ain't nothing, we being preachers, are nothing but sheep in shepherd's clothes. What you mean by that, Pastor? Meaning, I wear shepherd's clothes, but there are times when I have sheep tendencies. Wish I had help up in here. I can buy with the best of them. But thanks be to God, the word of God constraineth me. Are y'all with me here? So notice what he says. Come on, come on. He says that this word calls sinner. This word convicts sinners. But then this word, this is what I love about, converts sinners. See, you call them, they get convicted, and then they get converted. When the word of God is preached, when we apprehend the power of the word of God, it's preached to a general audience. Some hear, some don't. But when the word hits that particular um, field of harvest, it begins to plant and grow in someone's life. I, I, I can't understand it. I will preach... And spray the church with 66 bullets. Y'all got quiet on me. 37 in the old, 29 in the new. 66 bullets. And I will spray the church. And while I'm spraying the church and I look around, some are sleeping. Some are mad. Others on the edge of their seat just are swaying. Some ready to jump in the aisle. Why? Because the word of God hits us differently depending on where you are. Are y'all with me here? Some are like, I wish he'd hurry up. Some are like, keep preaching, pastor. It depends on where you are because there's a particular conversion through the word of God. It quickens. It makes us alive. It's a call of conviction to the word of God. Can I say this to you real quick? Salvation is not a group therapy thing. We don't get saved by groups. It's individuals. There's no family salvation. Amen. Salvation is personal. Jewish man, businessman in Chicago. He sent his son to Israel for about a year, wanted him to absorb the Jewish culture. And uh, his son returned back to Chicago after a year. And he said, Papa, I got great news. He said, what you learned, son? He said, well, I spent some time in Israel and I got converted to Christianity. Oy vey, said the father. What did I do? So he went to his best friend and he said, he said, Moya, I got a problem. He said, what is it, Ike? He said, I sent my son to Israel and he came home a Christian. What can I do? Moya said, funny you would ask that. I sent my son to Israel. He came home a Christian. 
let's go see the rabbi. So they both went to see the rabbi. They said, Rabbi, we got a problem. We sent our sons to Israel. They came back converted as Christians. The rabbi said, funny you should ask. I sent my son to Israel. He came home a Christian. What's happening to my young people? So he said, let's go into the prayer room and pray to God. Maybe he'll give us an answer. So they all three, Ike and Moya and the rabbi, go into the prayer closet. They begin to pray to God. They say, Lord, help us. We, our sons, we sent them to Israel. And they came back Christians and a voice came down from heaven. Funny you should ask. I sent my son to Israel too. The word converts. It changes lives. That's why we put a plug in for Bible study. Not so that I can have a packed room, which it is packed on Thursdays, but so that you can make a change in your life. That the word can convict and convince and convert and change you. And then lastly, watch this. Not only is the apprehending of the word of salvation, but then he says this, the apprehending of of the witness of salvation. Notice what he says. He says, it is of his will that he chooses us by the word of God. Here's the reason. Here's why he does it. The witness, the results, that we should be a kind of first fruit of every creature or every creation. In other words, God wants us to be the prototype the mantle for others to see. Can, can I say it to you this way? You know some folk who knew you when. Matter of fact, they tend to remind you of what you used to be before you met God. And they're waiting to see if this is real or fake, if this is a phase or a fad. And when you show them that this is real, you are a mantle, a, a, a prototype to them of what God can do when he gets a hold of a life and turns it around. Matter of fact, they, they start calling you by your real name, not your nickname. Because you do know we got nicknames based on how we used to live before Christ. No, y'all didn't know that? You know, they used to call certain women revolving doors. Everybody got a turn. You know, y'all, right. They used to call us by our nicknames. Pookie. Blade. I wish I had help here. Because that's what you carried. Shotgun. But God changes your name changes your personality, changes you completely. And so we need to apprehend the witness or, or, or the, the, the results of our salvation. See, when you read the book of Leviticus, we read in Leviticus where the Israelites were required to bring an offering to God. And what they brought to God was the first grain or the first fruits of their harvest. And so when James mentions this, as, as he talks about being the first fruit of creation, as a backdrop, he, he's shedding light on the fact that the crop of God is our souls. And that he harvested, harvested us after he saved us. He cultivated us after he saved us. And so what he says here, and notice the words, he says that we should be. See, I love it. He says he, he, he called us by his will through the word of God that we should be. Meaning what? That we're not there yet. That it's a work in progress. Don't, don't get it twisted. Don't, don't get discouraged. God ain't done with you yet. But you can look back and see where he's brought you. I wish I had help here. 
See, I, I'm, I'm now down to a pack a day instead of a carton a day. I, I'm now down to a shot of Cavassier instead of doing the whole bottle. I know y'all don't see that as progress, but that's progress. I only cussed two people out today. Hallelujah. That's progress. You see where I'm going? I, I, I'm looking at the little things about how God is bringing me along and, and showing a witness. He says that I should be an indication as to how valuable I am. He, God's invested in me. He's invested to the point where he wants to bring me from where I am to where I should be. Every born-again, blood-washed child of God has been saved and added to the family of God as a special, unique, valuable saint of God. We are separated from sinners. We don't do what sinners do. We're separated from them. We claim a different heritage. See, what is this month? Black heritage, where we plow, uh, proudly wear our garb. I think next week it's H, no, no, it's the sorority and fraternity uh, uh, week. Wear your black sorority and fraternity. And we're going to do that proudly. We're going to put up our gang signs. <laughs> right? We're going to do all that kind of stuff. We're going to holler stuff out. I ain't going to holler it out. But we're going to holler stuff out. I don't want the AKs beating me up. We're going to holler. See, the, I told you gang mentality. But we proudly display our heritage. But when it comes to our salvation, God wants us to proudly display our heritage. He's brought me from something. He took me out of something. He put my feet on solid ground. And when I walk, I've got to show what God has done for me. This world... It has to see that the blood is cleansing, that it's changing, that it's an agent that washes away our sins. My heritage is now in him. That's the witness. But then he says this. He says not only our heritage, but our humility, because that we should be a kind of. Come on, look at the text. A kind of. Pride is probably the greatest hindrance to growth. Pride. Nobody wants to be like God. I want to be me. I want to do me. I ain't changing. I ain't going to be no punk. Pride comes before the fall. Pride introduces us to a vast amount of foolishness. And false faith. There's some stuff you got into because of your pride. Because somebody dared you. I dare you. Oh, don't be no punk. You scared? And your pride kicked in. Instead of saying, I ain't got to prove nothing to you, you went ahead and did it. I wish I had help. We're going to make this run. I ain't going. Oh, you a chump? You ain't going? Just make this ride. That ride ended you 10 years in jail. Because your pride couldn't tell them no. I wish I had help. The absence of humility and the presence of pride serves to prove that we continually remain ungrateful by the grace that God has given us and shed abroad in our cold, darkened hearts. Pride will wipe out everything God has done. Our eyes need to be open, flowing, a display of gratitude and thankfulness. Can I say this to you as I'm closing? When we come in here on Sundays, all of us ought not walk in here with an expectation that we're owed something. Our expectation should come in here and be of one of gratefulness. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? I come in here knowing that God is a keeper. And I've come to discover that he keeps those that don't even want to be kept. 
I thank God that I passed by the accident on 495 and that I got mad because the car in front of me slowed me down only to realize that it was God that sent the car to slow me down so that I wouldn't be that accident. I wish y'all could see things the way God wants you to see it. He says, you've got to understand that he is molding you, building you, getting you to become, lastly, not only a heritage and a person of humility, but lastly, a person of honor. He says, so that you can be the first fruit of his creatures. Holy living and the preaching of holiness are twins that we don't talk about in church no more. I don't care if you're Methodist, Catholic, Baptist, Pentecostal, holiness, everybody needs to know about being holy for God. Because the Bible says without holiness, no man shall see God. And can I say this to you? I love you all. I love you all. But I also know that adultery and fornication and lasciviousness run rampant in the church. I didn't say this church, but I know it runs in the church. And our honor as children of God has taken a back seat to unthankfulness we are so unthankful jealous envious over what other people have instead of just getting on our knees and say God I thank you for what you have done in my life can I say this to you I wish you would understand this the reason I'm not rich and don't have a major mansion and driving a Maybach because I wouldn't come to church Oh, I'm the only one? God knows me better than I know myself. So you know what God does? He keeps me at a level that keeps me praying, that keeps me humble, that keeps me wanting more of him. I wish I had help here. The moment before you got a car, you used to catch the G bus, transfer to the 22 get on the subway to make it to church. God blessed you, gave you a piece of car. Now you drive past church folk. God can't give some of us some things because we don't know how to handle it. But what he wants from us is a life of honor and integrity in the church. Are y'all with me here? So as a child of God, I become a first fruit of his harvest. I become a first fruit of what God can do in a life that's yielded to him. Just as a farmer would display his crops, so God has displayed to the world what he can harvest when he gets in a life that is submitted to him. Are y'all with me here? C can I just say this to you? Uh, uh, everybody has in their homes something that is a manufactured product. Some appliance you have in your house that is a manufactured appliance. Some of us have toasters. Some of those toasters make four and six pieces of toast at a time. Some toast bagels. Some toast muffins. Some are very fancy with their toasters. Are you with me here? Some have refrigerators. When I was growing up, we called them ice boxes. But now they're refrigerators. They talk to you. They sing to you. They set the time for you. They give you hot and cold water. Ice makers. Wish I had help here. Certain parts of the refrigerator can be set to certain temperatures for certain foods. Refrigerators. Are y'all with me here? We got stoves. 
Some got gas. Some got electric. Some got stoves that turn on by themselves. Some got stoves that got six burners, four burners. Some of these elite stoves. Some of us got microwaves. Amen. Not the little microwave that just sits on the table. You remember them. The kind used to turn the knob. And when it was over, it went ding. I wish I had help. Now we got fancy microwaves that hang over the stove. You can cook a turkey in them now. They confection. I wish I had convection type microwaves. We all got different microwaves. We all got different stoves. We got electric can openers. We got crock pots, electric fryers, I with mixers. I wish I had help here. We got all kinds of appliances that are found in people's homes, and each of them does something different. That's why you got so many. Everything, I, I wish I had help here. What do you mean they do something different? You can't cook in the refrigerator. And you can't freeze things in the stove. Are you with me here? You can't microwave stuff in the crock pot. And you can't make toast, amen, in the freezer. Everything has its own reason for creation. And watch this, the appliance does what it's designed to do. Woo, pastor, you getting there, you getting there. Everything that appliance says it can do, it can do. Because that's why you bought it. That's why it was designed. As I take my seat, I stop by to tell you that in the same way that these appliances are designed to do what they do, God's first fruits point to yourself and say I'm one of God's first fruits I'm designed to do what God designed me to do I'm his creation and he dictates to us why we exist are you with me here he gives me my purpose he gives me my reason for living I operate outside of what I want to do and I do what I'm designed in God to do are you with me here walking in his purpose uh, uh, walking in his design doing what he called me to do can I just say this to you just like I don't put a uh, uh, cooking in the freezer a child of God don't act like a sinner you called from being a sinner just like you can't freeze something in the oven a child of God ain't supposed to be somebody whose mouth is more foul than a bartender I wish I had help here but God called you he made you he designed you with honor that you can walk tall and represent what he has done in your life do I have a witness here God wants you and I to be the first fruit of what he has done in your life and when people who knew you win look at you and say boy you're different you can give the testimony and tell them that before I met Jesus I was a mess I was a wretch undone I was dead in trespasses and sin far from the peaceful shore I was very deeply stained within sinking to rise no more but thanks be to God who snatched me who saved me who delivered me who cleansed me who changed me who did something beautiful in my life and now with honor I declare that I'm one of his first fruits yeah I'm one of the ones that he changed millions didn't make it but I'm glad I'm 
one of the ones that did. I wish I had two or three witnesses that would look back over their lives and recognize where God brought you from. Don't sit there and act like you ain't been nothing. Don't sit there and act like you ain't done nothing. If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? Remember my days. I was a hellraiser, a party goer, a smoker, a drinker, a cusser, a cut you. I wish I had help, but then God got a hold of me, changed my life, washed me up, cleansed me up, changed me. dear life. Thanks be to God that giveth us the victory. Thanks be to God that changes our lives. Say yeah. Come on, stand to your feet, stand to your feet.